The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. In the previous program, we talked about the matter of Jesus being asked if he paid the temple tax. We noted that this raises several questions, one being why had Jesus not been asked to pay the tax before, but was being asked to do so now? Well, the entire su situation suggests to me that Jesus may have been removed from the list of approved rabbis, and this conclusion certainly fits the background circumstances. Previous experience with asking Jesus difficult questions may have made the collectors a little hesitant to ask Jesus. But in the developing opposition, there was a growing desire to cause Jesus trouble and attack his dignity and credibility, so they went ahead. Well, Peter, impetuous as ever, without waiting to consult with Jesus as he should have done so, blurted out, yes. Well, by the same token, the collectors had no right to accept a third party statement on behalf of Jesus. And it reminds me of a double wrong that occurred in the United States when the district attorney of Western State cut a deal with a Catholic bishop over the pedophile problem. The bishop had no right or authority to make a deal for the church, and the DA had no right to accept it. Both parties violate the law. But there's how the world works. Well, this particular tax was, in its original significance, a redemption money for the soul of each man. How could the Redeemer, who redeemed all souls by the ransom of his life, pay this ransom money for his own life? Further, it was a tax for temple services. How then could it be due from him, whose own mortal body was the new spiritual temple of the living God? Jesus was to enter the veil of the holiest with the ransom of his own blood. He paid what he did not owe to save us from that which we did owe but could never pay. Well, when Peter entered the house, they got to a private place. He was perhaps conscious by this time that his answer had been a little premature, and he was perhaps also conscious that there was no means of meeting any, even this small demand with the financial resources at their disposal. Well, Jesus did not wait for any expression of explanation or apology from Peter, but preempted him and said, uh, what do you think, Simon? Great question. What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take tolls and taxes? From their own sons or those who are not children? Well, simple questions deserve simple answers, and Peter gave the only possible answer from those who are not their own children. Jesus replied, then the sons are free, aren't they? Well, Jesus could have added that he was the son of the great king and you, Peter, are also his son in a different way and so you are not bound to pay this tax. But if we pay the tax, then it is not a matter of positive obligation as the Pharisees have lately decided but a free and cheerful giving. Now, there's something really great and beautiful in the way in which Jesus showed his impetuous disciple the, the dilemma in which his answer had placed the Lord. And Luther says, we can see in this incident the loving, friendly, almost playful relationship which must have existed between the Lord and his disciples and it seems to establish the eternal principle that religious services should be maintained by a spontaneous generosity and an innate sense of duty rather than in consequence of some external compulsion. Duty is not always expedient, and there is nothing more unchristian than the violent maintenance of the strict letter of our rights. Christian life is not a matter of quote, doth Job fear God for naught, unquote, a spiritual quid pro quo, something given for something received. A true Christian is always willing to accept less and take less than his due. Therefore, he, Jesus, in whose steps we should walk, 
calmly at it. Nevertheless, lest we should offend them, you go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up and opening its mouth, you shall find a stator. Take that and give it to them for me and for you. Well, Dean Farrar notes that it was said that His Majesty shone forth in the very act of submission. He would pay the contribution to avoid hurting the feelings of others, and especially because his disciple had promised it on his behalf. But he could not pay it in the ordinary way, because that would be to compromise a principle and violate his position in God. So in obeying the law of charity and self-surrender, he would also obey the law of dignity and truth. And as someone has said, he pays the tribute, therefore, but taken from a fish's mouth that his majesty might be recognized. Well, this miracle has long been regarded by serious, serious students of the Bible to be the most difficult to comprehend. This is a one-of-a-kind miracle. It does not fall in the same category as any of the other miracles of the gospel. And one analysis of Mark's gospel gives the following classification of miracles. There are eight miracles showing power over sickness and disease. There are five miracles demonstrating power over nature. There are four miracles showing power over the devil. There are two miracles showing power over death. But this miracle told in Matthew chapter 17 does not fit in any of the above categories. If anything, this miracle of the fish shows authority over economic needs and demands, but it reveals far more than that. And Matthew tells us the story of the tribute money very succinctly and says, and when they were come to Capernaum, they that received the tribute money came to Peter and said, does your master pay tribute? Peter said, yes. And when he was come to the house, Jesus preempted him or interrupted him, saying, What do you think, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Good question. At the heart of everything World Missionary Evangelism does is reaching out and saving the lost through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do this through native missionaries. Right now, we have many native missionaries who need sponsors. That's right, partners just like you, who will help them become full-time workers for Christ. That provides this native missionary with the ability to give his life full-time to gospel outreach. We also need Bibles. That allows us to share the word with those we reach in the mission field. If you would like to either sponsor a native missionary or provide the gift of Bibles, simply call us at reading Matthew's account of the tribute money issue. So let's read the scripture again. Very interesting. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, 
Does your master pay tribute? Peter said, yes. And when he was come to the house, Jesus preempted him or prevented him, anticipated him, saying, what thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? And Peter said to him, of strangers. Jesus said to Peter, then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take up the fish that first comes up and when you have opened his mouth, you shall find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and for you. First note that the usual method of fishing was with nets, but a weighted line with several hooks drawn rapidly through the water is employed at Tiberius even in 2017. The piece of money in the mouth of the fish was a stator, and the word should have been left as it was and not changed by the translators to, quote, a piece of money. Now, a stator is an attic or Greek silver coin and was equal to two of the aforementioned tax drachmas, and so was the exact sum for both Jesus and Peter. This is a little humorous. And since they were in Peter's house, it covered Jesus and Peter only and not all the other disciples. And that is very, very interesting. Now, examining the story closer, the tax the collectors asked about was an ecclesiastical tax. Note, the custom or tribute the Lord spoke about was a local, think of state, a local customs duty on imported or exported goods. The tribute Jesus spoke of comes from a Latin word for census and was payable to the Romans and was a political tax. Well, without beating the subtleties of the text to death, and they're very interesting, Jesus was asking Peter if the local rulers of the land take civil taxes from their own house or from those who are not of their house. When Jesus referred to the children, he was referring to himself as the child of the king. He, Jesus, was free of the king's tax. Now, either Jesus was teaching subversion of the divine prerogative, or he was claiming to be a fellow of the Lord of hosts. In saying this, Jesus was claiming supreme personal divinity, in case you've missed the point. Well, this most powerful claim of Jesus was confirmed and certified in the most impossible way. It would either happen or fail to happen. If it had not happened, the collectors could have reported what would have been extreme blasphemy to their masses in Jerusalem and Jesus could and would have been tried for blasphemy. That there is no more said about this matter is eloquent testimony to its truthfulness and to the total wickedness and perniciousness of the religious authorities in Jerusalem. Well, it is highly unlikely that Jesus could have stayed at Capernaum without his presence being known to the inhabitants. In any case, it is clear that his stay was very brief and of a strictly private nature. The incident of the tax payment of the fish are the only records of the visit that remain. Well, by this time it was autumn or fall and all of Galilee was stirring with the air of preparation that preceded the starting of the annual caravan of pilgrims to one of the three great yearly feasts. And this time it was the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, tabernacles or ingathering, as it was also known, was intended to commemorate the passage of the Israelites through the wilderness, and it was celebrated with such universal joy that Josephus and Philo called it, quote, the holiest and greatest feast, unquote. It was known among the Jews as the feast, and it was preeminent, which may seem strange to Christians today who do not know much about it at all. It was kept for seven consecutive days, and the eighth day was celebrated by a holy convocation and during those seven days, the Jews, to recall their desert wanderings, lived in little booths made of thickly foliage boughs of olive, palm, pine, and pertle. And each person carried in his hands a festive palm branch or willows of the brook or fruits of peach or citron. 
and during the week of festivities, all the priests were employed in their turn. Seventy bullocks were offered in sacrifices for the seventy nations of the world. The law was read daily. On each day, the trumpet would sound 21 times in an inspiring and triumphant blast. And this is probably where we get our tradition of the 21-gun salute. The joy of the occasion was deepened by the fact that the feast followed, but four days after the awful and comforting ceremonies of the great day of atonement, when a solemn expiation was made for the sins of all the people. Well, on the evening of their departure for the feast, the family and relatives of the Lord, who were always referred to as his brethren, and some of whose descendants were known to early tradition as the Desposniae, a sacred name for the blood relatives of Je Jesus, came to him for the last time with a presumptuous but well-meant interference. Like the Pharisees and the multitude and Peter, they fancied they knew better than Jesus himself the line of conduct that would best accomplish his work and hasten the universal recognition of his claims. They came to him with a language of criticism, of discontent, and almost of reproaches and complaints. Why this unreasonable and incomprehensible secrecy it contradicts your claims. It discourages your followers. You have disciples in Judea. Go there and let them too see the works which you do. If you do these things, manifest yourself to the world. Well, if they could use such language to their Lord and Master, if they could, it were, thus challenge his power to the proof, it's only too plain their knowledge of him was so narrow that they did not know who he really was. World Missionary Evangelism, through its wide variety of mission outreach programs, is an evangelical force in developing nations, and it all begins with native missionaries. Called by Christ to do His work, our native missionaries are first and foremost soul winners. Often facing hostile opposition, they have the courage to reach out in compassion to the lost, sharing the good news with those in their communities. But that is just the beginning of WME's evangelistic programs. World Missionary Evangelism reaches children through vacation Bible schools and Christian schools. So even as we feed the hungry bodies of little ones, we also feed their souls. For almost six decades, WME has been building churches in both urban and rural areas. Most of these churches are used every day of the week and become beacons of light in the areas where they serve. Churches not only provide worship opportunities, but they also offer a community gathering point, education, child care, and even serve as feeding centers for the hungry. WME not only sponsors native missionaries, we train them. World Missionary Evangelism has local pastoral education programs for new missionaries and continuing education programs for those who have been in the field for years. WME also has Bible colleges that provide degree programs for those seeking a fuller knowledge of the Bible and Christian outreach. The evangelism in World Missionary Evangelism is not just a part of our name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is at the heart of everything we do. Jesus was a stranger to his brethren and an alien to his mother's children. And such dictation on their part, the bitter fruit of impatient vanity and unspiritual ignorance, showed a blameable presumption. Yet the Lord only answered them with calm and gentle dignity, saying, No, my time to manifest myself to the world, which is your world also, and which therefore cannot hate you as it hates me, is not yet come. You go up to the feast. I choose not to go up to the feast, for my time has not yet been fulfilled. So it was he answered them, and he stayed in Galilee. John, in his seventh chapter, tells it this way. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, 
because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. His brethren, that's the brethren of Jesus, therefore said to him, Depart hence, go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you do. For there is no man that does anything in secret, and he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, then show yourself to the world. And John adds that sad note, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I go not yet up to this feast, for my time is not yet come. And when Jesus had said these words to them, he abode still, or to use a modern word, he remained and stayed still in Galilee. Well, the words of Jesus that my time has not yet been fulfilled distinctly intimate that such a time would come. And it was not his objective to intimate it to his brethren whose utter want of sympathy and reverence had just been so unhappily displayed. He wasn't going to tell them when that time would be. And there was a very good reason for this. It was essential for the safety of his life, which was not to end for six months more. It was essential for the carrying out of his divine purposes, which were closely interwoven with the events of the next few days, that his brethren should not know about his plans. For these reasons, he let them depart and go ahead of him in complete uncertainty as to whether he intended to follow them or not. And his family was certainly certain to be asked by the multitudes if Jesus was coming to the feast. And it was necessary that they were able to answer with complete truthfulness that at least he was not coming with them. And whether or not he would come before the feast was over, they really didn't know. That this must have occurred and that this must have been their answer is evident by well, the fact that the one question buzzed about from ear to ear in the streets was, where is he? Is he already here? Is he coming? Well, as Jesus did not appear, his whole character and whole mission were discussed. And the words of appraisal concerning Jesus were vague and timid. Some said, he's a good man. The words of condemnation, on the other hand, were bitter, were bitter and emphatic. Nay, he deceives the people. Well, no one really dared speak his full thoughts about him openly. Each man seems to have mistrusted his neighbor, and everyone feared to commit themselves too far while the opinion of the Jews and the leading priests and Pharisees had not been finally or decisively declared. Well, we'll turn again to John, who puts it this way in John chapter 7, verses 10 through 13. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, he is a good man. Others said, nay, he deceives the people. Howbeit, no man spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now suddenly in the midst of all these discussions, in the middle of the feast, unaccompanied by his followers, and unheralded by his friends, Jesus suddenly appeared and taught 
in the temple. Well, by what route Jesus had reached the holy city, how he had passed through the bright thronged streets unnoticed, whether he joined in the innocent mirth of the festival, whether he too lived in a little booth of palm leaves during the remainder of the week or wandered among the brightly dressed crowds of an oriental gala day with palm branches and the citron in his hands, whether his voice was raised in the great Hallel or the great Hosanna, we don't know. All we are told is that throwing himself, so to speak, in full confidence of the protection of his disciples from Galilee and those followers in Jerusalem, he was suddenly found seated in one of the large halls which opened on the temple courts, and there he taught. Well, for a time the crowd listened to him in awe-stricken silence, and still some of their old reservations came back to mind. He is no recognized rabbi. He belongs to no recognized school. Neither the followers of Hillel nor those of Shemai claim him. He is a Nazarene. He was trained in the shop of a Galilean carpenter. How in the world does this man know letters, having never learned he'd never been to college? World Missionary Evangelism's missions often extend beyond normal methods of Christian outreach. For generations, we have built farms and taught the skills needed to sow and reap. With operations ranging from crop farming to livestock, poultry, and even fish production, WME adapts our agricultural outreach to meet the strengths of the area and the needs of its people. For decades, World Missionary Evangelism farm missions have provided not only a business income for the poor, but the food produced on those farms is often used in our feeding programs and by our children's homes. The importance of this ministry and what it produces cannot be overstated as it opens the door for us to share the gospel. Thus, even in farming, the evangelism in World Missionary Evangelism is not just a part of the name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is the heart of our work.